So good evening, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I'm going to begin with a few remarks, but I really care about the Q&A. So we'll see how this all works out. First thing I wanted to say is that, yes, I've been doing this a long time. That's why that Wikipedia page, it's really just about how old you are and how long it takes you to do everything. But, um, but in all of this time that I've been working on the war on terror and national security and civil liberties, nobody ever asked me to speak in Connecticut, which is a problem because that's where I'm from. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think the things I focus on are very much have to do with the fact that I'm from Connecticut because I grew up in New London and uh, where the sub base, you know, where Groton is the sub base and where we had uh, Pfizer and where we had General Dynamic. And these were all, um, you know, global security, national security industries, not to mention the Coast Guard um, and, and a variety of other things. So it was in my mind. I have, you know how many um, nuclear submarine launchings I went to as a child? <laughs> yeah, because my grandfather was mayor of the town, so I had a photo. But so it was very prominent in my mind um, that that security was something that the country had to take very seriously. So I feel like I was kind of destined for this. I didn't really have a choice. So somehow I ended up here. So thank you for inviting me to Connecticut. I very much appreciate it. Um, and I wanted to tell you a little about, about what I do because it will inform uh, my remarks, which is I founded and run a uh, center devoted to the intersection between national security and civil liberties. And I founded it 16 years ago. Um, at NYU, I was there for 10 years, and then I moved it um, to Lincoln Center to the uh, Fordham Law School campus, and we've been there for about seven and a half years. But it's the same, same people, same projects, same, same. And um, it's a fascinating um, area to be in, and that's sort of where I want to begin, because on Friday, um, uh, General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, gave a speech. Uh, and in this speech, he said, uh, and I'm, I'm going to read you what he said, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. He said, we will continue to prosecute the campaign about, uh, against terrorists, but great power competition, not terrorism, is now the primary focus of U.S. national security. So for people like me who run centers devoted to national security, we're like, okay, can we go home? Like, is it done? Um, I thought it was a pretty brave thing to say and a pretty interesting thing to say. It's not surprising. With Russia in the headlines, China in the headlines, Iran in the headlines, South uh, North Korea in the headlines, of course, it, it, we've been moving towards the, the, the state actor conflict uh, arena for a very long time, and some of us, including myself, would argue we never left it. Um, however, the, the idea that we're moving out of terrorism as the focus of our national security agenda is actually somewhat interesting. And so I wanted to talk today a little bit about, a little bit retrospectively, about how we got to where we are today very quickly. I mean, I could do it in 10 hours, but I'm going to do it in 15 minutes. Um, and then talk about some of the unresolved issue from the war on terror that I think um, may or may not be a problem going forward. So, so that's where I um, want to begin. And I want to start with 2001, which uh, all you know is September 11, 2001 attack on the World Trade Center um, and, and uh, in Washington. Um, but what happened after 9-11 until today happened extremely quickly. This was not a let's take a few years to figure this out, let's do this incrementally. This happened within 12 weeks. And I'm just going to tell you what happened and how it's still with us today. So, and you'll know most some of these things and you won't know other things. The, the first thing that happened was within 24 hours, the White House produced something called the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. Um, it was a document which basically said that the President could use any and all ne appropriate and necessary force to go after the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and those re responsible for 9-11. Um, and um, they gave it to Congress. Interestingly enough, what, that's what Congress passed. What they actually gave Congress said, um, the Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, those responsible for 9-11, and anyone else the President deems is um, an enemy going forward. And even after 9-11, the Congress said, no, that's not right. First of all, we give war powers and we're not going to give them in that open-ended way. They passed the authorization for the use of military force, limiting it to this 9-11 construction. It's a very important moment and one that people have forgotten. Um, 
the AOMF <coughs> still exists, and I'm going to come back to that at the end uh, to talk, to talk about that at the very end. Next thing that happened was about <coughs> six weeks later was the passage of the Patriot Act, which you all know about. Um, it's quite lengthy, but what it wanted to do was to give extra powers to law enforcement and to intelligence and to other agencies in the government that have an intelligence component, like the Department of Treasury, to have new powers for investigation and for pursuing those who they deem to be um, terrorists. And then a third document was passed in November of 2001. It was a military order at the time. The military had nothing to do with it. Um, it now referred to as an executive order, and it was a presidential order on detention, and essentially detention interrogation, and, um, and what became military commissions. And it was a document to deal with non-citizens in detention, presumably captured on the battlefield, which at the time was, of course, uh, Afghanistan. These three documents, the authorization for the use of military force, the Patriot Act, the military executive order that I've just referred to created almost everything you know of in the war on terror came out of these three documents in the following months and years. Now that's the piece of the national security framework that we know about and that we knew about at the time. All of these were public documents, all of them were reported, all of them were talked about and debated. But at the same time, there was a whole other conversation going on in Washington and that was a secret conversation about what else we could do in the war on terror to make sure that 9-11 was not going to happen again. And remember that, I'm sure I don't have to tell you this, but 9-11 was a, a shock to the psyche of New Yorkers, Americans, and anybody who had really not thought about their safety or their security in the ways they were going to have to think about it afterwards. And the conviction of people in Washington who knew Al-Qaeda and knew the Taliban and knew the Middle East and knew terrorism was that there was going to be a follow-on attack. And while they thought that follow-on attack was going to be in the next 24, 48 hours, which was an Al-Qaeda signature to have sequential um, acts of terror, um, it was in the psyche for a long time and still is something to this day that there could be another attack and it was the, the responsibility of the United States to do everything in its power to prevent that. And so in addition to all these visible powers, procedures, programs, laws, authorizations, there were secret programs that were put in place. I'm sure you know some of them, but the, the one that's most lasting and most important was actually a surveillance program known as Stellar Wind or the President's Surveillance Program. And um, one, of the, um, one of the lawyers at the Department of Justice that when I wrote this book, I had to talk to, I talked to maybe 400 people that I had to, um, that I talked to, I remember him sitting me down and he saying, you know, everybody's, and he met me, everybody's focused on torture and talking about how bad these torture policies are, but I want to tell you something. It's nothing compared to what's happening in surveillance. Um, and it is true. We will never know what was done in, at, at the low, highest levels for surveillance. We know some of it, um, but we'll never know. And most of it, there have been many reports, but most of them have been redacted. And he told me to my face, no one's ever going to know. And I think it's probably uh, better that it stays that way. Um, remember that it was so secret that even some of the highest officials did not know about torture, did not know about the CIA black sites, did not this way, did not know about um, that better. Okay, I'm not going to repeat everything. Did not know about. Um, and I just, there's this, just one sentence that sort of uh, stayed in my mind. It's kind of humorous, but in a non-humorous uh, context, which is that a number of these policies, particularly the surveillance policies, were done, um, uh, authorized legally, but done between the White House and a section of the Department of Justice known as the Office of Legal Counsel. And um, John Ashcroft, who was the Attorney General at the time, was often bypassed in the discussions. And there's this moment where he's in a meeting the White House counsel at the time is Alberto Gonzalez. Alberto Gonzalez was Bush's sort of personal lawyer in his own way. He had brought him from the governorship in uh, Texas, and he had brought him to the White House. He later became the Attorney General. And Ashcroft is just so 
frustrated by all the things that are bypassing him that he's not getting to weigh in on. And he turns to Alberto Gonzalez and he says, you know what? Your initials may be AG, but I'm the Attorney General. <laughs> it's like, you know, imagine how frustrated you have to be to say that. So um, what happens after these visible and invisible uh, secret policies are put in place and come together is that not very long thereafter, there was a shift in the lawyers that came to work in Washington, and particularly inside the Justice Department. And those lawyers, Republicans, some of them had worked in Department of Defense, some of them had worked elsewhere in government, some of them were new to government, discovered memos, the secret memos that had authorized the secret programs for torture, for surveillance, for um, the CIA detention sites, for a whole bunch of things that Americans really did not know about. This is before I'll be great. And um, these lawyers included the Deputy Attorney General, who was Jim Comey, who became the director of the FBI, who I understand is no longer director of the FBI. Uh, but it, it did include him. And with him in the lead, because he's not afraid of controversy, as we know, um, they convinced the White House that, they had to st that some of these policies were so illegal that they had to stop them. And in 2004, you, the, the Bush administration began a policy of sifting out some of the things that were secret and turning them into law. And so we saw a slew of laws in the latter half of the Bush administration. One was the 2005 uh, Detainee Treatment Act that was a response to the, um, the pictures from Abu Ghraib of people being you know, tortured and abused. One was the Military Commissions Act of 2006, which basically said if you're going to try people, you have to have a system. You can't just pretend to have a system, which they did. Um, and one was a new surveillance law, which took some of the secret surveillance programs, one in particular, and turned it um, and made it lawful, which is essentially what Comey and his friends wanted to do, was it's OK to change things, but we can't change things secretly. It's got to be legislated, and eventually had it um, uh, legislated. So it's fair to say that during the second half of the Bush administration, Guantanamo, surveillance, interrogation, and counterterrorism were rethought. It, it, there was, nobody pushed a reset button, but there was a sense that, that things had to happen in a more transparent and lawful way. Then Obama comes into office, and of course, you know, he's just going to, he makes those wonderful statements at the beginning, we're going to end torture which was kind of over at the time. We're going to close Guantanamo in a year, which was so refreshing to some of us. Because I wrote a book called Guantanamo's First 100 Days. And I've been waiting the whole time to write a book, Guantanamo's Last 100 Days. And now, forget it. I'm just going to write a different book. I'm not even going to wait. Um, and, um, and, um, and he promised a new uh, detention policy. But all of these policies learned from what had been happening in the latter uh, Bush administration. And, and, and then he added his own wrinkle, which was to, I mean, it existed under Bush, but not in this way, to create a, um, uh, um, a targeted killing uh, regime with drugs uh, that exists to this day, but, uh, but took off exponentially uh, under Obama. And, and as you know, killed American citizens who, had they been captured, if they could have been captured, um, would have been brought into court. So by the time Obama left office, you sort of began to see the shape of what was happening with the war on terror. Some things were being ended, like torture, hopefully like Guantanamo in his mind. Other things were being changed. So for example, the Patriot Act. We don't have the Patriot Act anymore. That's not one of the, the laws that has stayed with us. The Patriot Act sunsetted in 2015. I can tell you why later, but long and the short of it is, the surveillance policies were declared declared illegal by a circuit court. And that was essentially the end of the Patriot Act as we knew it. Now we have the USA Freedom Act. It was a version of the Patriot Act. Um, so, so some things have sunsetted, but many things are still with us. And I want to talk about, just in, in the rest of this today, the things that are with us that I think are maybe a problem, and you decide whether they're a problem or not. And the first one is the authorization for the use of military force. To this day, we still have, the country still has the exact same authorization for the use of military force that enabled us to go into Afghanistan. In 2002, the United States passed another authorization that was for the war in Iraq, later used when we went into Iraq, 
It's never really referred to and never really um, used or relied upon. Why is it important that we still have this, this, what's called the AUMF, so let's just call it that, the AUMF? Because remember I told you about the original wording that it wasn't just for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and 9-11? In effect, it has become, under Bush and definitely under Obama, a vast piece of, legis of, um, of, of congressional authorization, in which, in the original one, there was no time limit, there was no geographical limit, there was only some kind of identification of the enemy limit, and there was no wording about what would constitute an end to the war on terror. It could have said the death of bin Laden and his lieutenants. It could have said um, bringing to justice in another way, like the courts, uh, the top leadership of uh, al-Qaeda. It could have said and wouldn't have said some kind of treaty, because these were non-state actors. But essentially, it was a document that was created that could outlive itself. And when Obama came into office, a number of documents were created in court that later became blueprints for legislation and just kind of policy without any backing. And that was the word, which I'm sure you've heard, associated forces. The AUMF, without any congressional authorization, went from being a, a document that authorized the use of force against Al-Qaeda to a document that you, authorized the use of force against anyone they wanted. And the words were Al-Qaeda and associated forces. But there's no, there's no list of associated forces. There's no approval for associated forces. There's no litigation for associated forces. So Yemen, Syria, Somalia, you name it. You want to know where we're, we have forces? They're all under the AUMF, all under this expanded definition of the AUMF. And on every single Congress, of uh, politicians, Republicans, Democrats, and independents bring up, we need to redo the authorization for the use of military force. They just don't know how to do it. Some want to just get rid of it. Some want to replace it. Some want to get rid of it and, and just do one for ISIS. But they've never been able to take it on and figure it out. And as a result, we just don't ha have a document. And the reason this is interesting is because basically, there's a, a silent agreement, which is, we'll just do what we have to do. And why mess with it? And why try to limit it? Because we bring this up, we're going to be more limited than what we're doing now. And three administrations in a row have essentially agreed to this. So I think it's important, and I think it's important to notice it. Another piece of um, the war on terror that remains, and this one I'm not going to go into in, until the very end of my talk, is Guantanamo. I don't really have to explain that, do I? Guantanamo exists. It has no real authorization to exist right now. Um, it has 41 individuals in it, five of whom were cleared for release and will never get out. Another uh, group are uh, being tried under military commissions, maybe. Um, and, um, and under the Bush administration said, there are three dozen people we will never let go. The Obama administration said, there are three dozen people we will never, we will never charge them, we will never let them go. Don't ask us, we're just telling you. And those three dozen people are just going to be there for perpetuity. And th there's no lawful way to do that. But perhaps under one of these first documents that I talked about, either the executive order on detention or the authorization for the use of military force. And while the AUMF sits there as an expansive, ever expandable <coughs> piece of le legislation, the um, Guantanamo sits there now as an ever-expandable uh, symbol. When, when this attack in New York with the, the guy Saipov who mowed down the people uh, in Battery Park City um, with his truck, the bicyclists and others, um, what did they say? We're going to send him to, we're going to make him an enemy combatant and send him to Guantanamo. So um, Guantanamo has never taken American citizens. It's not lawful right now to put an American citizen there. But as a symbol, it's a threat. And it's a threat not just to non-citizens for whom it was set up for, but for citizens. And now it's there. So that's another legacy that we have. And then the final thing, and this is the thing that concerns me the most in terms of legacy, is the 9-11 trial. So 9-11 happened, um, and there were a number of people that our Justice Department and our intelligence agencies have held responsible for this by name. One of them, you know, was Osama bin Laden. But there are others. 
and you probably know their names as well, two of them are Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin al -Shib. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin al -Shib were rounded up in the, in the couple of years after 9-11, and they were brought into custody, and they were put in one of the CIA black sites and interrogated and submitted to uh, enhanced interrogations, what I call torture. And um, in 2006, President Bush, uh, President Bush decided to move them to Guantanamo. So 2006, that's a long time ago, right? I mean, it's a long enough time to be able to try people. They moved to Guantanamo with the idea that they would eventually try them. Um, they, uh, and then Eric Holder became the Attorney General under uh, President Obama, and he decided, what the heck? We've tried 500 terrorists in federal court. We should just try these guys in federal court. We've already, we know how to do this. We've done this many times. So he said, we're gonna move them. Famously, he said, we're going to move them to New York City because that's where they try, that's where the most terrorism cases have ever been. So, New York, Mayor Bloomberg, Chuck Schumer, a whole bunch of politicians and others said, no, you're not. It's too costly. You haven't paid us for all the costs it cost us anyway after 9 11 to fortify the city. We did this by ourselves. You're not doing this. It's going to close down Chinatown, which is where the uh, with the uh, courthouse abuts. It's going to be a security nightmare, and this is not happening. And in the delayed conversation between Washington and New York, Congress eventually passed a ban on any transfers from Guantanamo to this country for any reason, including trial. So the 9-11 trial that could have happened didn't happen. Why do you have trials? You have trials for a number of reasons, but two of them are these. Because the people who have been the victims of a crime, by which I would say all American citizens, not just New Yorkers, the people who have been victims of a crime need to have that narrative played out. Not just in a 9-11 commission that nobody reads, not just on the movie screen, they need to see it in public. They need to see it adjudicated. Uh, courts are healing. They are healing narratives. It's, it, this is just part of jurisprudence and how we understand it. And the American people have not had that moment. Why? Because when Eric Holder returned this to Guantanamo, they then charged him. They vacated the, the charges here. They charged him at Guantanamo. That was 2011. I don't know about speedy trial, but you couldn't do that here. You know, um, Why haven't they tried them? They've had dozens of pretrial hearings. They're never going to try these guys. I'll come, you know what? I'll come back here and talk when they try these guys. But they're not going to try them. What they say now is that they might be able to start jury selection a year next January. But they also might not be able to start jury selection next January. And I, you know, when you talk about what hasn't been resolved in the war on terror, this is something that hasn't been resolved that mattered. And this all brings me to something that's been in the news for the past four months that I just want to make sure you know about, because all of these things, Guantanamo, the 9-11 trial, and the AUMF all converge in this one thing, which is that on September 12th, an American citizen was detained in Syria for fighting alongside ISIS. You know this, right? He, um, he was declared an enemy combatant, which is hilarious, because we don't have enemy combatants. We haven't had enemy combatants for a decade. And they're certainly not American citizens. It's, it's what? It was just a way of saying, this guy's not going to have any of the rights of American citizens. Forget it. He's in a black hole. You're not going to know his name. We're never going to tell you anything about him. So of course, the ACLU rushes in and says, oh, sorry, it's an American citizen. He needs a lawyer. He needs at least to be told he could have a lawyer. He can turn down the lawyer. And we're going to file a habeas petition. You can't detain him without a reason. You have to say something. You have to charge him. You have to do so. That was in September. Just now, this has finally been litigated through the courts. And um, yesterday, like at midnight, I think, the judge made a ruling that, she, she made a ruling last month that he, the ACLU could talk to him by a Skype, that the ACLU could introduce a habeas petition for him. And then the government came back and said, you know what, forget it, we don't need these American courts. He's got dual citizenship. He's, I think it's Saudi, but who knows what we'll actually find out. Saudi and American, we're just gonna give him over there. He's in Iraq now. We'll give him, we're gonna give him to this other country because he's a dual citizen. So the ACLU filed and said, they can't do that. He is, he may be a dual citizen, but one of those dual things is American citizen and he hasn't renounced his citizenship. Um, and, um, and, and you can't assume, under American law, you can't assume giving up citizenship. You're not allowed to say, you actually, Gave it up. You, you have to say the words. I gave him. And um, 
So now the judge, imagine the pressure on this woman. This is a tough, th I, I, it's, it's a lot of pressure in every way. She said, you know what? If you want to transfer him, government, you got to give 72 hours notice. So this is an interesting challenge because 72 hours is enough time for the ACLU to come in and actually challenge it on the merits, right? Um, so that's where it stands today. And all of that happened because we never resolved these issues. We never resolved how far the AUMF could cover. We never resolved how the detention authority of Guantanamo worked or didn't work, you know. And we never resolved this issue of trial in difficult circumstances, you know, where they can't really figure out how they're going to try it, which is what's happening with the 9-11 Commission. So in, when I... You know, when I wrote the book, I thought I was at the end of it because it was two administrations and that seemed like enough. But now I realize I wrote the beginning and the middle, the long of, of the story. And I don't think there's going to be, I, I actually think there's not going to be an ending. I think what's going to happen, I could be totally wrong, but just stepping back from it, I think it's just going to like go on and on and on until it fades out. Those guys are going to stay at Guantanamo. They're, how old are they? 50, 60? They could, a lot of them are sick, you know, a lot of them are very sick, nine of them have died. You know, I mean, they're going to just stay there and people are going to forget about it, which most people have anyway. I think that the AOMF will never be, I could be wrong, but it's possible it will never be addressed. It will just say, what does it matter? We're going to finish up there. We have other fish to fry, basically these state actors that we're now going to focus on. Um, and with the, so you have the 9-11 trial, the Guantanamo guys, and and the authorities, and I have just this very funny feeling that we're never going to formally, officially, in any way, bring it to an end. So that's kind of, that's what all I have to say. And I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but that's where I think it's headed. So thank you. I think we'll take questions uh, from side to side. Let's we'll start here. released a lot of these Guantanamo people. What, why actually are, are we just keeping these particular ones? Okay. Um, okay. So it depends on who you ask. Um, but let me put it this way. Let me just tell you, you're absolutely right. There were 800 people in Guantanamo to 774. To start with, um, George Bush released 524 of them because it was clear they just were the wrong guys. You know, like people in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and he was not soft on terror. Nobody would ever accuse him of that. Um, and Obama released another nearly 200. So what happens is they have a periodic review board that reviews each one of these cases and says, you know, could you, are you too much of a danger to release? They've decided they can't charge them. They have no evidence to charge them with. Some of them will not be released because they were tortured. One in particular. I'm telling you, if they release every single person from Guantanamo, they will not release this one detainee whose name is Abu Zubaydah. He comes up in all the books that anybody writes about, about this you know, interrogation uh, of program. But they said at the time, it's, you know, it's in Diane Feinstein's report, but it's also been reported in, by other FBI agents as well. But they said at the time, this guy can never, ever, ever live to tell the tale. He can never get out. He can never talk. So there's a variety of reasons. One is just not wanting to, um, to fear, thinking that some of these people really are bad guys. It's hard to believe that. If you, if you talk to their lawyers, and if you just talk to the psychologists who interact with them, they're like broken. They've, I hate to say it, but you know, they've been, a lot of them are tortured. They've been in isolation for a long time. They've been in limbo. It, it, it's one thing to be charged and sent away for life. It's another thing to be told, we just don't know. And so there are a lot there, and a lot of the detainees that have been let out, um, they don't go outside. They're like, they don't want anything to do with anybody. They just want to be left alone, seriously. Um, and so it's a very good question. And some part of it is just kind of hubris, you know, which is we said we're, these guys, see, I don't really know. But at this point, really, how, look, my answer to this is different, which is we know who these guys are. It's not like they're, you know, we don't that we don't know where they are and where they might go. We're, you know, we're going to place them where they go, like the other uh, um, 700. But they are. Um, but we have spent a trillion dollars on our intelligence apparatus, on our law enforcement, on our military capacity. It's not bad, by the way. 
like we actually know what we're doing in a lot of these areas. These are not these are these are these are professionals who have had 16 years of training to think about this problem. The idea that we can't let these guys out that if for one second they began to do something, we wouldn't be on them in two seconds is hard for me to believe. And it's interesting. I mean, there are a number of detainees that have gone back to England. They figure they'll just those guys, you know, breathe and they're gonna, you know, know it. So uh, it's a good question. It's just. But let me just tell you one thing that will definitely not, you know, make you sleep tonight. Which is, um, you know, how much it costs per detainee at Guantanamo Bay right now? Of your tax money, well, not my tax money, your tax money. Um, <laughs> Eleven million dollars per detainee. I don't know, it seems like a lot of money could be used for schools or stuff. Anyway, just good question. Thank you. Other side of the room? Wendy's got her. Can you fast forward for t t today under Trump? You haven't mentioned anything about where we are as he's moved along. So, um, good question. Um, and that's kind of why I started with Mattis. It's, it's hard to say where they're going because they talk about terrorism a lot, but I do, I do think they're way more focused. They're focused rhetorically on terrorists, but this focus is on state actors. Um, Trump is making it difficult in that Middle East policy does affect terrorism. There's no getting around it. These two things are related. And the more we alienate our allies in the Middle East, the more in trouble we are. And whether it's the Qataris because of you know the ban against Qatar, or whether it's the Saudis, or whether it's the Iranians, you know, depends on you know how you want to configure it. All of this is fraught with blowback for us in terms of of, of terrorism. So um, so that's the w one thing about them. In terms of Guantanamo, they are not they do not want to close Guantanamo, if, and I'm not sure they want to use it. But they want it as a threat, which is kind of what I was saying. Um, the one thing that's happening with the, the Trump administration that's very disturbing, I mean, there's a lot of things to me that are disturbing, but one, one thing that's very disturbing is their determination to privatize a lot of this. So they want to privatize detention and interrogation. This is not a good idea. This is what went wrong the first time, is turning this over to private contractors to the tune of $189 million, by the way. Like, come on. Um, um, and, and to privatize the national security state, in essence is really not what a democracy is. So that's, to me, one of the worry signs of, um, of that. And so, um, and then all the other things that worry me, but those are some, and also drone strikes, which under Obama caused tremendous amount of blowback in terms of our allies. Look what's happening with Pakistan. We just cut Pakistan off, right? Oh, Trump just cut Pakistan off. That's actually a very interesting move because, um, Pakistan's always been a problem. And who, you could, I could argue either side of that case, but how you do it and when you do it and, and preparing for what it will mean, I'm not sure this administration has done that. So if that's some help. I, I think they don't have a, grand, a, a big picture strategy. I think they have a lot of little reactive strategies. Over here. Karen, some say that terror is a tactic, just like Blitzkrieg is a tactic. We didn't have a war on Blitzkrieg. I'm, I'm sorry. We did not have a war in World War II on Blitzkrieg. Yes, exactly. Okay? And to what degree calling something a war on terror is by itself a problem? Yeah. Um, here's what I think. I agree with that. And, I, and, and terror is a tactic, and it's bigger than just Islamic terrorism as you know, as we know. Um, and I, I think that it's a little bit more than just a tactic in current circumstance, and because it was so ideologically tinged, and because it was a state act, a non-state actor. Has it been a state actor? I think it would have been a, and I do think to some extent it, it was state actors, we just didn't want to acknowledge that. But once you focused on non-state actors, it became more than just a tactic. Having said that, what I think went wrong in this whole war on terror strategy, kind of the way you're referring to it, is that after 18 months, when they realized that it really was, wasn't quite a war, they should have, they should have 
um, reset things. They should have said, okay, we, we reacted one way, now we're cooler heads, we're gonna rethink this and think about if it's a war, what does it need to be, what, what brings it to the level of a war, and what do we need? But you're actually, you're, but what you're getting at is, is very important because the, um, the definitional moment, this is just the same thing as the AUMF. It, it's so um, vague and so broad and so not tied to events and, and countries and realities that it's a problem. The war on terror, you know, it's often compared to the war on drugs, you know what? So I think it's a little more than a tactic though. I, I, I do think that. Thank you very much for an enlightening um, conversation. Um, you're, you're certainly um, leveling a lot of criticism at the various and sundry administrations in terms of how they've handled the reaction to the 9-11 event, which frankly was, you know, short of Pearl Harbor, the worst things that had happened to the United States. And there was a lot of reaction that needed to be implemented and mostly in an area where people weren't experienced, they didn't really know what they were doing. Um, but as you pointed out a few minutes ago, the intelligence service, the military are sort of the best in the world, they know what they're doing. And so to stand on the outside and throw forward the criticisms that you are throwing forward, um, don't you think there's a little bit of uh, sort of disingenuity uh, when it comes to sort of pointing the finger. So, so that's a really interesting question. And yes, of course, I still, and, I, and I think about a lot. I should tell you a little bit about what my center does. My center, just so you know where this is coming from, um, all we do is interact with top level officials inside the government. That's what we do. Whether it's Comey or Brennan or Chris Ray, who was there the other day, that's what we do. We just, so to the extent that public, I've, I've interacted with, asked, hosted, had his fellows, had his associates, had conferences with top counterterrorism officials in the United States and around the world for 16 years, I've been listening to them the whole time. So it's not like just reading the documents and reacting. It's listening to them, it's talking to them, it's asking them the questions. And by the way, they are open. A lot of these guys are open to some of the things I've said. That it, uh, this, is, this doesn't just come, it comes from working on the outside, which that's a choice, um, but it doesn't come from not listening to the inside. And while it's true that a lot of critics, um, um, a lot of critics don't like to listen to these guys, my comfort zone is way broader than just about anybody else who stands in the, in the critics space. So, however, <coughs> um, the, the problem with what you're saying is that governments can say that, and that's what our government says. It's national security, go away. You know what, Congress? You think you know something? Well, we're not gonna tell you, because this is classified, and we don't care if you're on the Intelligence Committee. We're telling you the balance of powers doesn't apply when it comes to national security. But the fact is, it does apply. And the same thing with the courts. The courts have been told time and time again, national security, you should defer to us. This judge that's deciding on this enemy combatant case right now has said many times on the record and in, in her opinions, you know, um, courts usually defer in national security. But they, if, you, if you take it that way, then why pretend you're a democracy? Just give it to the government and let them do what they want. Our opinion is supposed to matter. And somebody, it is good for the government to have to be held accountable. You know, Obama said, let's go forward, not look backwards. Um, and we all kind of said, okay. But it turns out that Trump is able to do a whole bunch of things that we wish he were, would ha weren't able to do because Obama said, let's go forward, not look backward. And my guess is, if a Barack Obama were standing here and not me, he would say what I would say. Maybe we should have held him accountable. Politically, it was really hard for him. I don't think I would have done any differently than he did. I think he, he, he was boxed in, he had priorities, he wanted certain things, he was willing to negotiate. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that not holding these people accountable has left a blueprint that still remains, whether it's torture or detention without due process or killing of an American citizen without due process with a drone strike, 
these are these are things I think it's worth fighting for. So, and, and I take, but I do take your point that I'm not going. I do. On this side, no? okay, over there. <clears throat> Could you talk a little bit about foreign aid? Now, this is kind of a complex issue, and it's not real transparent. Not to be cynical, but if foreign aid theoretically should be to help people who uh, countries who need help, but I think it's again to be cynical, maybe we're buying influence. As you may know, the most foreign aid goes to Afghanistan, which is around $2 billion. Can you tell us how much we give as a country in foreign aid? And am I being overly critical? Or I mean, just can you kind of share your thoughts with us? Yeah, so foreign aid is particularly in the Middle East. You know, uh, recently, I'm sure you've read in the headlines about all the foreign aid we're giving to the Philippines for counterterrorism. So sometimes it's, you, look, Foreign aid is, is made up of a variety of things, and this is why Pakistan has become such an issue. Influence <coughs> is sort of an amorphous term, but what you want is, is protection. It's not just influence, it's protection. You're, we'll give you aid, but then we expect you not to turn on us. The, 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 the game changer with Pakistan was finding bin Laden in Abbottabad. You know, right, right there, right across from the military academy. Um, and it's been very hard for the United States to believe that Pakistani government didn't know. They, to this day, will say they didn't know, but it's been very hard to believe. So part of it is buying that, that there's a kind of unspoken, will you, um, will you, um, uh, you know, talk to us? Will you, and we don't expect everything from you, we know you've got your own interests, et cetera, et cetera, but how much, now, in Afghanistan, it's a whole other, scenario because, and it's interesting that you ask that, there are different agendas from Washington about Afghanistan and they've, they've conflicted with one another from the very beginning. For example, were we going after Al Qaeda or were we nation building? And different people inside the administration, all with legitimate explanations, wanted different things out of that money being put in Afghanistan. A lot of individuals were opposed to nation building, not just rhetorically, like Bush. He was opposed to it rhetorically, but was willing to fund a lot of nation building, building programs. But there were a lot of individuals in the CIA in particular who were like, listen, we gotta take care of Al-Qaeda. That's our mission here. So it's never, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a one-liner. There are a lot of different factions here as well as there. And um, so it's, it's, it's used as an act of good faith and in different countries it plays out different ways. Um, you know, I noticed the other day you were just talking about, you know, foreign aid. The Saudis this week decided to, you're not going to believe this, the Saudis this week decided that they were going to fund uh, humanitarian rebuilding and rebuilding in Yemen after, after they destroyed the country. I mean, seriously, it's a me, and, and nobody else is doing it. So part of it is to, who do you want to be beholden to you, you know? And that's one of the ways to use foreign aid, is to be the good guys. So that somebody else doesn't come in there, terrorist group or whatever, and, or other country, and, be, and take up that, you know, that kind. So it's tough. And, and one of the big issues here is the issue of proxy um, activity. You know, who's, who's, doing, who's spending whose money and for what purposes? And who owes who what? So that's a very complicated topic. But if you talk to me afterwards, there's a book I want to tell you about. But, so just talk to me afterwards, OK? Yes. Thank you. Um, if you put yourself back to September the 12th, and George W. Bush said to you, what should I do? What would you do? What would I have done? Yeah. What would you have Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that is a very good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, <coughs> first of all, I would have invaded Afghanistan, and I would have finished it. You know, the Bush, this is what I think I would have done. Who knows? Um, I, you know, the United States pulled out of Afghanistan before they completed the Battle of Tora Bora, which is where ostensibly bin Laden and his top guys got away, for reasons a lot of people don't understand, and there's, there are some explanations given by different factions of CIA, DOD. Um, but I would have I would have I would have completed that battle. 
the, the reports coming out of not just the United States, but counterterrorism um, uh, 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 police around the world basically said, and it was true, the Afghanistan invasion was remarkably successful. Remarkably successful. <coughs> one of the things that one of the top counterterrorism guys said to me at the time was, I can, I can give you an, a list of names of who, who's still alive from Al-Qaeda. And I was like, really? Um, and I, but a lot of counterterrorism officials thought that. And um, we didn't finish the job. We just, we just decided to divert everything, didn't finish, and then, and then of course, Iraq got this ridiculous. So I would have finished Afghanistan, and I would have focused on Al-Qaeda, because that was the problem. And they were the guys that attacked us, and we needed to get rid of them and bin Laden. Done. So that's one thing. I would, probably wouldn't have tortured people. It doesn't, it's not my thing. And, I, and it, it didn't help. Um, and when I, was, I was always struck by the fact that George Bush said, I'm going to bring them to justice. You know? And so justice can be war, but justice can also be what we always did with terrorists, which was when we get them, try them, and put them away for life. So we didn't do any of those things. We didn't finish the battle. We didn't capture the guys we wanted. I would have, these guys that are at Guantanamo, they should have been trying to put away a lot for what? You know, a decade and a half ago. So that's, does that answer some of it? Probably what I would have done. But then again, it's so easy to be. It's a tough question. It's a tough question, but the Afghanistan question isn't that tough. There are a lot, a lot of people who are like, what do you finish this? Right? So that part might be a little easier. So you have alluded this, to this a couple times where you said, um, there's in response to one of the questions about an act of terror being a strategy. Yeah. And um, you alluded that there were state actors there. Then again, in this answer, the same thing. One of the things that I think was a weakness of the Bush response was they were all set up to deal with state actors. That was Dr. Rice's area of expertise was state actors. And they didn't believe that NGOs or non-state actors had a play in, at the international level. And kind of what you're saying here, too, is that's how we got distracted. Because we were, it's easier to think about state actors than it is to think about non-state actors. So I'm just kind of curious, is that what you're saying? Is that commentary there, or what are your thoughts on that? So I am saying that, and it's why I actually uh, think that, you know, as I'm sure a lot of people do, that 9-11 um, should have been prevented, and the refusal to confront what was couldn't get to the National Security Council and, and Bush's desk until um, August and September of 2001 is not okay. And that we now in a different situation, and this, it's so interesting that you raise that, because now, that's why this Mattis thing really interests me. And it's been interesting me for years. So what do we have that's an institution devoted to non-state actors? We have parts of the Department of Homeland Security and the reason for Homeland Security. I made a list the other day. Like, it's long, it's not here. Um, we have the National Security Division at the Department of Justice. We have part of the intelligent direct, Intelligence Directorate at the FBI. We have the um, D Director of National Intelligence. These are all post-9-11 um, um, uh, institutions that exist to deal largely with non-state actors and that were created because we had a gap in our non-state actor response, appreciation, etc. And there's many more. I'm just naming these. So now all of a sudden, it, oh, it's state actors again. And I've been asking officials this for a year, at least a year, because they keep talking about it. And, and I, because now I'm worried that we've put all our resources, talent, focus into the non-state. And what about our state? What about the apparatus and the, for, for intelligence from the state, the state actors? And it really worries me. And, um, and, and then you have the gutting of the State Department which is, you know, being a continual thing under, um, under this president. And so that is the one place where you can hope for a kind of state-to-state -state actor relationship. And so I, I, and look at all the ambassadorships that aren't filled. Did you ever go on that site and look at the ones that aren't filled? It's pretty daunting. So I think um, this is, it does worry me. It worried me back then, and it worries me now. And, um, and, um, you know, if you remember the language at the turn of the 20, what century are you in? The 21st century? Yeah, okay. If you remember the language then, it was China. China. The 21st century is going to be about China. Remember? It was like always, 
And you could feel like the intelligence services and just the thinking about what this was going to mean to be in, in, the new, in the new century and how the United States was going to relate to the other great world power, China, that was growing. And this became um, a kind of um, new thing, terrorism, in 2001. Now we're back to thinking about China and Russia. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just, yes, I think. And so the question is, are we going to duplicate what we've done for non-state actors with state actors, or are we going to take these institutions and try to use them? For, uh, and I don't know the answer. And by the way, nobody I ask has an answer. There's a way. I don't know. So, yeah, good question. Over here. Would you just tell me the mission of your center? Because I don't understand exactly what your purpose is in the center. I, I'm hearing all the information, what you do, and information you gather, but what do you do with it? OK. So um, the purpose of my center is to think about national security from the outside, not from the inside, even though we have a lot of insiders um, at it. Um, and what we, what we do. What we do is think about national security in its broadest sense with a particular focus on civil liberties, but it's always expanded beyond that. So I'll just give you an example. We have and have had for the past 16 years the only database of terrorism prosecutions in the United States. That's why we're kind of the media go-to person. So if you want to know who's being prosecuted, why, what the sentences are, how these things play out, nobody aggregates the information, not even the Department of Justice believe it. So we're the people that do that. We've done it forever. We still do it. So that's one thing we do. We run um, international off-the-record summits with government officials that, and with others who wouldn't necessarily talk to each other um, about issues that are very edgy. So they could be an issue. Could be Syria. Could be torture, depending on you know what period of time it is. So we convene off-the-record conversations with major players. Um, and then we do a lot of public events for, for New York. Sometimes we do 100 events a year for New Yorkers, who, and they are packed of people who are just hungry. And I mean, I don't do them, but we bring in people from Washington or from the courts or from wherever to debate and talk about different issues. So we are a public education um, institution uh, for anything that has to do with national security. And we focus particularly, at least I do, on uh, issues related to civil liberties. So for me, Guantanamo, et cetera, are big deals, but not for everybody online in my little thing. We have a, just so you know, we have a morning news service that we've had for 10 years that people love. You should all get on. It's called The Morning Brief, and um, it's great. It's, no, I'm, t I'm serious. Like, I, I created it for myself, and then the professors around me and were like, how come you get that? And I was like, so for a couple of years, it was just mine. It was awesome. But now it's everybody. Um, and it's just blurbs on the major stories in this lane. And, and we do also have a cyber brief that uh, comes out on Mondays. So we do a lot of publication. A lot of publishing. If you go on the website of my center, which is the Center on National Security, and it'll, it'll say morning brief right there. You just click on it. And then you subscribe, and it'll come to you every night. You don't have to click on it. I hope I got that right. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. <clears throat> you talked about China as if they might be maybe our enemy or our competitor. If you step back a second and think about what's going on, they own two to three trillion dollars worth of, uh, of our debt. Um, they make a lot of stuff that we buy, and they consume 45% of the world's commodities. We have the best navy in the world, and if we were a competitor of theirs and sort of went to war, their economy would crash and burn probably within mm -hmm. two weeks because yeah. they wouldn't be able to buy coal, iron ore, copper, nickel, you name it. So, and they're smart people. They don't have a choice. They can kind of crab at us in the press, but at the end of the day, they know that they're dependent on us and the rest of the world. So I don't think they're that independent. Am I wrong? Am I right? What are your thoughts? No, I, 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 I think that's a perfectly plausible thing. I think we, we're living in a very, with, under a very weird administration. So yes, what you just said, all of that makes sense. But actually, what's going to happen going forward? I wouldn't. I'm, I'm just not making any bets. And I think, you know, you can focus on state actors by becoming more friendly and you know, getting closer. But what's happened? What what national security <coughs> people are worried about 
not me, but you know, is is um, that as the United States pulls out of more and more and more places in the world, China is stepping in. So it's not so much about being an enemy or going to war. It's about what you asked about before. It's about influence. It's about it's about wanting to be, you know, the big dog in the room. And and in, we've pulled out of a lot of uh, international places that we were in before, and, and quickly. And so most, if you read the Wall Street Journal or you read foreign policy or you read foreign affairs, this is the kind of thing that the articles will talk about, which is China's going to become the, the place who gets their companies there first. I mean, part of it's a business competitive. I mean, you know, when I, when I think about this, I'm thinking about business competition, which brings in the whole cyber. But so that it's, it's not about going to war. It really is just about how far can America's influence extend in a way that stabilizes who we are and our economy and all these kinds of things. Yes, in the back. Thank you for staying so long. Uh, when you talked about the purpose of a trial, if you've been marching the gymnastic girls speaking up and the catharsis that they're going through in terms of their therapy or whatever, yeah. that was a good point. My other concern is, this is, you know, I don't mean to be personal with you, but how do you personally and professionally deal with chaos in the world today? <laughs> That's an easy one. No. I, I, have you run to know? I can't have an answer. With chaos? Please. Yeah. So I think the message of this century, seriously, is deal with it. Like, why do we have to be so secure? Like, I'm, I'm serious. The fact that we're so scared of insecurity and chaos is a problem. Like, just, we need to, to refocus that. You know, one of the things that people always say, well, the pendulum's going to swing back. All the lawyers that work around me, oh, we've got to wait for the pendulum to swing back to the good old, yeah. No, like, no. We need to, like, skip ahead, not go back. And I do think we're just going to have to live with a little more uncertainty in a good way. Like, what's wrong with uncertainty? And chaos is part of that uncertainty. And and I don't mean that we, we're just going to have to get over it. I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but that, I, I, I think being terrified of it is really personally and professionally for everybody, it's just not healthy. It just makes us do bad things. And, um, and then we reject them. So, so I say, learn to love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Karen. And let me just remind you that there are still her books for sale back there, and Karen will be very happy to autograph any books. And we have a small gift for you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We hope you'll come back to Connecticut again. <laughs>